start with good morning and welcome to 2021. I'm real excited to start a new yearly Saturday, once a month Saturday series. And this year I'm gonna change things up a little bit. Um, I'm gonna add a lot more anatomy this year to my classes. I have two of my loves are movement and anatomy and they dovetail so nicely to understand the movement both because you're doing the movement and you're feeling the movement and also a little bit more, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot more about anatomy so you can really connect and learn more about your body. Um, so uh, let's see, um, we're gonna work from a chair today. So you want a real chair, not sit on the floor, uh, even a futon, usually, uh, not a futon, a safu, usually makes you have to really um, flex your hips. That's not as good as a chair. So I'm gonna encourage everybody to work from a chair this morning. And our theme today is in a way back to basics, but for a lot of people, they, they never really understood the basics. Uh, our theme for today is we are going to move in the six fundamental reference movements in our world of three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. I'm gonna go to a screen share and uh, talk over a slide I'm gonna show you to orient you to uh, what I'm gonna be talking about. So bear with me. And I need to, Isaiah, how do I minimize these pictures so they're not in my way? Hold on for just a moment. I don't want this, these pictures oh. in my way. Oh, I see yeah. that little, that little, that little stripe, what, there it is. It keeps moving around. There we go. Okay, good. Okay, so now, hopefully, and you check and make sure everybody's on screen share. Hopefully, you're seeing a slide. Whoops, that's the wrong slide. Hopefully, you're seeing this slide, and it says three dimensions or planes of movement. And where movement comes from in our three-dimensional world, we have three dimensions of space, we have one dimension of time, which means everything we do, all movements we do take place over time. And when you're translating dimensions into movement, you look at the reference planes. Uh, the, a, a dimension has a reference plane and we have three of them. And I, tr I drew in these, I didn't draw them, but I, there's a program and I created these lines. I was trying to do it accurately and it was very difficult for me to do. So we're going to look at the first plane we're gonna look at, you don't have to know the name, but it's the sagittal plane. And the mid sagittal plane cuts us in half from the top of our head, through our nose, our chin, the middle of our neck, the middle of our body, down between our legs, assuming we're standing in perfect balance. And it gives us a, a right and left side. It divides us into sides. And movement along this plane, every plane has two movements. And since there's three planes, each movement, each plane with two movements, we have six fundamental movements, period, in the world, in our world, in our three-dimensional earth world. And these three dimensions go through every single joint in the body. Now, some joints move and some joints don't, but the, the, the planes of movement still go through all the joints. And in this sagittal plane, we have flexion and extension. That is curling the spine forward right along our midline and arching our back backward right along midline. Then we have in the uh, coronal or frontal plane that divides us into a front of the body and a back of the body. And from the top of the head, it's supposed to be right through the ear, down the side of the neck. It, it goes through the shoulder to the center of the armpit, down the sides of the rib, down the sides of the pelvis, down the sides of the thigh, the foreleg. And usually some people cut it at the ankle. Some go a little forward of the ankle. I'm with Judith Aston. I go a little forward of the angle of the ankle. And that gives us 
a, a, a backside and a front side, and the movement along this plane is side bending. So we can side bend or lean to the right, we can side bend or lean to the left. Two more fundamental movements. The third plane is the horizontal or transverse plane, and it cuts us right at our center of gravity. Our center of gravity is considered below our navel and deep in our body. And uh, the, uh, this uh, plane gives us rotation. So we can turn to the right, we can turn to the left, rotation. And the central axis is our spine. So we have a central axis that goes from the top of our head to the center of our pelvic floor. And that's our central axis. And along that axis, it, uh, parts of the spine go right through that axis. All the planes of movement, all the planes of movement dissect or intersect rather with our spine and with our central axis. And I'm gonna come out of screen share. Okay, so that's where movement comes right out of physics. And we are going to take the six fundamental movements today and we are going to do them in our trunk. Because we there's too much, we're gonna do different parts of the body in different classes. And today we'll focus on the trunk. In a moment, I will define the trunk for you, but I have a couple of reminders. Um, and that is, um, first of all, there's a lot, we can do a lot of movement, but all movements, are one or more of those six fundamental movements. We have six fundamental movements. You can move your body and parts of your body all over the place. Any combination of movement is a combination of, you're either right on a midline cardinal plane, reference plane, or you're in some relationship where you're using two or more planes. And we can define all movement everywhere in the body, through every joint, through every little millimeter of our body by the six cardinal reference planes and the combination of the planes working together. Okay, so let me just uh, review a couple of things. As we move today, you're going to please move slowly and with awareness, back away from pain, follow medical directives, <clears throat> Um, much of the time we'll be using our pendicular process, two parts, we gently contract into a pattern and then we slowly release or decontract out of that pattern to rest and to our new neutral. Let me just say that our brain organizes all movement in relationship to our spine, which is our central axis. And all, the brain organizes all movement in relationship to our center of gravity. It's a given, it's background, we don't even think about it. We do all these different movements, but in the background, the brain is making sure it's oriented as best it can to our central axis, to our center of gravity. And so we don't fall over, our balance system plays a big role. And we usually don't even think about the role of all of that in the background, even of our voluntary movement. So uh, we're going to um, work with, I'm gonna go back into screen share. And we're going to work with um, our, um, our trunk today. So let me define what our trunk is. It's a rectangle. Whoops. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I fudged on some of these slides. I have to be careful how I use my cursor. Um, it's, a, it's a rectangle. It goes across the top of the shoulders and it cuts us right where the cervical spine meets the thoracic spine right here. It goes across the top of our shoulders. It actually includes our shoulder joint. It comes down. It actually includes, here's our hip joint. It includes our hip joint. 
It goes along our sits bones, or these are called the ischial tuberosities, the bottom of the ischium, ischium bones. And then it comes back up, including our shoulders. This is our trunk. And we're gonna divide the trunk into three areas today. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But um, uh, first let's just orient to sitting. So I love this picture because it really shows your sits bones. And we're going to keep orienting ourselves to sitting because when we're at the computer or when we're doing sitting work, it's so easy for us to slump and to, to go off balance. And so here are some points of reference for us. We want to, and you can use your hand, your fingers to touch different parts of you. So why don't you take your fingers and touch the very top of your head, trying to get right at the crown, right at the crown point of your head. And that is the upper part of our central axis. I don't have a picture of, of the pelvic floor, so it's not the tailbone, but between the um, ischial tuberosities and in front the pubic bone, between those two areas is our pelvic floor. And the middle, in the middle of the pelvic floor, it, the perineal body, some people call it, that's the center of your pelvic floor. And your vertical axis that you wanna orient to right now with your feet on the floor is from the top of your crown. And think about going right through the center of your body to the center of your pelvic floor. You wanna line up the center of your pelvic floor and the top of your head. You wanna firmly balance yourself on your sits bones the weight on your sits bones as much as possible should be equal. You want your feet on the floor. Most of your uh, weight support in sitting is on your sits bones, a little bit on your feet, but it's really your sits bones that, um, that are carrying our weight. And I just put the three views of the spine. Here we're looking at the front of the spine and the anterior front of the sacrum. Here we're looking at the back of the spine. This is usually what we think of in our mind's eye. And, the, and here is the view, the, here is the uh, curvature. And our central axis, actually it goes something like this. It goes through most of the bodies of the lumbar. It goes a little in front of the thoracic. It goes through a lot of the bodies of the um, cervical spine and up to the top of the head and down to the center of the pelvic floor. Let me just look at my notes for a moment. And we're going to be doing our six fundamental movements through our trunk. So here we have this picture where we can keep this rectangle in mind. And we have the three the three sections we're going to work with are the rib cage. And here you have a front view and a side view. And you can see some of the back view of the ribs in this one. Here you can see the front of the ribs and the back of the ribs. This section is the somatic center. These sections through the trunk are three dimensional. So they not only go through the bones and the muscles but they go through the organs. So in, in the rib cage, we have the heart and the lungs, for example. Uh, we have overlapping some of the, um, uh, right under the diaphragm, which is a dome in here. We have stomach and spleen, we have intestines, they go all through the somatic center. Um, ovaries, all, uh, we have all uh, bladder, all of those things, a lot of those are right in the somatic center, some higher, some lower, kidneys. And, um, and then with our somatic center, we have the famous low back, the lumbar spine is part of the somatic center, just like the thoracic spine is the part of the rib cage section. And the sternum in the front is like the thoracic spine in the front, the thoracic spine in the, sp in the back is like the sternum in the front. And front to back, we connect with the ribs. This is the rib cage section. 
Then in the somatic center section in the front, it's a very much larger space in the front than it is in the back. So the somatic center, the lower border of the somatic center is the complete crest or rim. We, we think of this, this is the iliac crest. But then as if we continue around the whole rim, this is the pelvic bones, and then coming up the whole rim, that's the bottom of your somatic center. Just like this in the front, the bottom margin of the ribs is, is the top of the somatic center in the front. And then the side of the somatic center follows the lower border of the rib, including the two floating ribs. And then in the back, in the back, the bottom of the ribs is the, um, is the top margin of the somatic center. So the somatic center is very long and much bigger in the front and much smaller in the back but in the back, it has the lumbar vertebrae, the famous low back. So very important. And then we have the pelvis. The third section is, is the pelvis. And here it's highlighted. It's composed of three bones. You don't have to know the names, but it's ilium. This is the ischium. The bottom are the sits bones, the ischial tuberosities. Here's the two pelvic bones. There's a disc in the middle. So these three bones fuse and with this disc and um, uh, this, this, these are your pelvic bones and inside the pelvis is the bottom of the spine, the sacrum, the triangular sacrum and the coccyx or tailbone. S the cervical spine, head and neck are not considered part of the trunk. They come up, they're very important. We're not gonna work with them today. Okay, so those are the three, uh, the three areas that we're gonna work with today. Um, I wanna point out just a couple more things. Again, I want you to notice that the shoulder joints are part of the trunk, but not the arms. The scapulas or shoulder blades, shoulder blades are part of the trunk. They're not part of the rib cage. The shoulders are not part of the rib cage, but they are part of the trunk. The scapulas or shoulder blades are part of the trunk, but they're not part of the rib cage, but they float and move in all kinds of directions. They float over the rib cage. The only, okay. I think that your center of gravity, just to orient you, is deep. It's considered in front of the second sacral sacrum. It's below your belly button. It's deep in here. And again, we're orienting to our vertical axis. Okay. I'm going to come out of screen share. And I'm going to... Um, Move, I'm gonna move my chair back so that today as we do movements, I'm actually gonna do a lot of the movements with you. So let me set up my own uh, screen. I mean, my own, yeah, I'm gonna leave the screen where it is. I worked this out all this morning. Let me see if I've, that's pretty good. You can see my trunk. I actually am gonna bring my notes with me. Okay, so we're gonna do the six fundamental movements in all three sections. And we're gonna start with the pelvis because the pelvis, um, maybe I actually will do a screen share. Sorry about that. Let me go back and just, uh, let me just point out a few things about the pelvis and then, and then uh, we'll do the movements. So uh, I pointed out a few things already. <clears throat> you, the sits bones, the whole pelvis, including the sacrum and coccyx, 
obviously the buttock area, uh, the back of the pelvis covered with muscles, sacrum highly ligamented. We have deep uh, muscles uh, in the inner part of the pelvis. We have the iliacus and we have a good part of the psoas. Uh, so this orients us to the pelvis. And um, and, uh, the, and the pelvic rim is gonna be very important. So take your hands and put your hands, one on each side, along your pelvic, your iliac crest, the pelvic rim, just to feel it. We can palpate a lot of these uh, areas on ourselves. So here's the iliac crest, you, if you can, I want you to find this point as you come forward, there's a, a point that sticks out into your hands. It's a good reference point. And so uh, maybe you can find that. You can palpate the top of your pubic bone. And a really nice thing to do, and I'll come out of screen share for this, a really nice thing to do is to feel your sits bones. And all you have to do is if you can slide one of your hands under, you're gonna do both one side, we're gonna work with both sides, slip it under and just feel your uh, sits bone under one butt, butt cheek and really feel that bone, that's an orientation bone and then feel your other sits bones, you have to slightly lean over so you can get your hand there if you can. And those are really important uh, points as well as these points in the front, as well as being on the top, feeling the crest or rim uh, at the top of the pelvis. Okay, let's do our six fundamental movements starting in the pelvis. So we're going to start with our arch and curl arch and flatten, arch and curl. Arching where we, first let's orient to sitting. Let's orient to sitting in alignment, feet on the floor, bring your ankles under your knees, not wrapping your feet around your chair. Orient from the top of your head to the center of your uh, pelvic floor. Equalize your weight on your sits bones, visualize your central axis. Okay, now, as you inhale and arch, this is extension. The first two movements that we're gonna be working with in this sagittal plane are extension and flexion. They represent the arch and the curl. And so when you arch, most of you know how to do this. You, your weight comes a little forward of your sits bones your belly kind of comes out, your tailbone is behind you, your head is behind you, your back is arched in extension. And then come to your neutral. And then inhale to exhale. And on an exhale, you're going to curl. You're going to bring your weight a little behind your sits bones. Your front of your body is contracting and shortening. The back of your pelvis is is opening up, it's widening or broadening. And then come back to your neutral. Put your hands on the rims, on the crest of your ilium. Now inhale, move into your arch, a little in front of your sits bones. You're arching your back backward. Feel that your pelvic rim is coming forward. And the orientation in anatomy books, this is called an anterior pelvic tilt, where the rim, the top of the pelvis is coming forward, your tail is going backward. Come back to your neutral slowly. So we're using the pendicular process right now for movement. And now we're going into a, a voluntary curl, inhale to exhale, curl. Feel that the rim, your iliac crest, the rim of your pelvis is moving backward. It's got a posterior or backward orientation. This is called a posterior tilt. 
and slowly come back to center. This last set, let's notice what contracts and what lengthens. As you inhale and arch, your tailbone goes back. Your belly actually opens up, but the belly is more somatic center. It's the tilting of the pelvis that happens because of the muscles more in the somatic center. When you arch, your lower back muscles contract. That's more somatic center. But the muscles in the front and the back uh, contract and relax to rock the pelvis either forward, either forward or backward. And so when we're inhaling and arching, our low back is contracted, our pelvis is in an anterior tilt. When we're in a curl, somatic center muscles contract and it rocks our pelvis. So our pelvis is going into a posterior tilt. And then come back to neutral, just relax for a moment, just for some variety. Let's add a little bit in our arms as we do a little bit of, of, of kind of somewhere between a slow flow and a pendicular process with arch and flatten, feeling our pelvis. So we inhale and arch, anterior tilt. We're in the pelvis, even though lots of other things are coming along. Exhale, curl, posterior tilt in the pelvis. And uh, my arms like to roll in. And uh, inhale, arch, extension of the spine, extension of the pelvis. The um, rim of the pelvis comes forward, the lower back muscles contract, exhale, curl, the rim of the pelvis backward, abdominal muscles contract, my arms like to roll in. And you can just gently go back and forth, feel the rocking, keep your attention in your pelvis, even though lots of things are moving. Feel the rocking on your sits bones of your pelvis. Your, your center of gravity is deep. It's more in the somatic center, but it's deep in under your belly button, deep in the body. And you can kind of get a sense perhaps of where your center of gravity is if you were standing in perfect balance. Okay, that's two of the six movements. Now we're going to do side to side movement or side bending movement. So, gotta find my notes. Okay, so side bending, we have to orient again to aligned sitting, sitting on the sits bones, aligning the crown of the head, aligning the crown of the head with the center of the pelvic floor aligning to our vertical axis in our spine, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, equalizing the weight on our, uh, on our sits bones. All right, now in a chair, which we're in, to side bend through our pelvis, we have to, we have to figure out how we can do some rocking side to side. This is my right side. I'm gonna use directions according to my body. It'll be opposite to you unless you wanna work with your left side, but I'm a little dyslexic at times and I, I have trouble reversing everything. So I'm going with my right side. Now, if I wanna side bend so that, remember our, sp our spine is curving, our spine is part of all of these moves. We're focusing on what happens in the pelvis and of course in the spine, I have to shift my weight onto my left sits bone. And for a lot of people, this is a really tricky thing to do. I could put my hand under my right sits bone and kind of help it lift. The other thing I can do, I can cheat a little bit and I can take my right foot and I can press it down to help me move, uh, to help me rock to the left. And now I'm using leg muscles to get in position. See if, if you need to do that, that's fine, but see if you can get these, the trunk muscles, especially somatic center muscles in this case, the obliques, 
to rock your pelvis. We're in the pelvis, side bending. The pelvis comes up on the, and the inside of the curve. Uh, this is a right, um, I'm, I'm bringing the right hemipelvis up. My spine is, the inside of my curve is to the right. The outside of my curve is to the left. Okay. If you put your hands on your pelvic uh, crest, on your iliac crest, bring your weight to your left sits bone to lighten or lift your right sits bone, you can feel the rim of your right hemipelvis goes up, the rim of your left hemipelvis goes down. A lot of us talk about a high-low hip. Most high-low hips are because of muscle contraction. Maybe not all, but most. So right now, uh, my obliques, some of my quadratus lumborum are very contracted. And if I walk around with a right high pelvis, chances are what I need to do is learn how to release and decontract these muscles. And then my legs even up, this is that leg length difference. It's usually right here at the somatic center and the pelvis, one side of your pelvis is high, one is low. Let's go to the other side. Bring your weight to your, to this side. For me, it's uh, my weight is in my right sits bone. My left sits bone is lighter or lifted. My pelvis, we're looking at the pelvis first. Well, you can look at whatever you look at, but also focus on your pelvis. Your pelvis lifts if you put your hands on tops of the uh, iliac crest. Now your left hemipelvis is high and your right hemipelvis is low. And most leg length differences and high, low pelvic area, the top of the pelvis is because of contracted muscles, a lot of it in the obliques and some in the quadratus lumborum. So this is side to side movement. Now in the rest of our spine to do a consistent side bending, let's bring our weight. I'm, I'm bringing it into my left sits bone so I can lighten my right sits bone. My somatic center muscles contract, my ribs contract, my right shoulder comes down, my right ear comes towards my right hip. And now I have a curve in my spine the inside of the curve is to the right. The outside of the curve is long. You can even put your hand up and feel short, long. You can change. Now rock your weight into your other sits bone, short side, high hip, low shoulder, curving where the inside of the curve is to the left, your ear towards your shoulder, and you have short side, long side, short side, long side, and come back to center. Let me just look at my notes and see if there's anything else. Ah, one more thing, you wanna make sure that your SI joints in the back where your pelvis and your ilium bones come together are comfortable. You wanna back away from pain or do the movement smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. Let's go to rotation, rotation in the pelvis. We're still in the pelvis and we're orienting to comfortable aligned sitting, top of the crown, center of the um, pelvic floor, central axis is it right in the middle, equal weight on your sits bones, feet on the floor, ankles under the knees, and now rotation is turning or twisting. And you might say, how are we gonna do that in the pelvis? And here's how we're gonna do it. So I'm gonna start by turning to the left. This is my left. You can go with me or you can go opposite. And in order for me to turn my pelvis to the left, my feet are going to stay where they are. They're not going to move, but my right thigh and knee is going to come forward. My left is going to, my left thigh and knee go a little backward and my pelvis turns to the left. Now you might say, well, everything is turning to the left. That's fine. 
let your body be comfortable. You're still focusing on how you can turn your pelvis no matter what's happening in the somatic center or the rib cage. So for me to turn my pelvis to the left, I have to have some ability to move on my chair. And thanks to Jerry Wiley, one of my colleagues, uh, he learned this in his Feldenkrais training. And the saying was, your ass is not glued to the chair. So let yourself swivel a little bit so your right thigh and knee can go forward, your left thigh and knee can go backward, and your pelvis can turn. If you bring your fingers on the front points of the pelvic bones, it's called the ASIS for short, and you turn your pelvis to the left, you will feel your right AIS, ASIS goes more forward, your left ASIS goes more backward. Many people, when they stand, they have a twist in various places. If, they're tw if you're looking at their pelvis and you see this twist and their pelvis is turned to the left, you can feel it if you put your hands on their ASISs or they put their hands on and my right ASIS is forward, my left ASIS is backward. I can go the other way. Now for me to turn my pelvis to the right, my uh, left thigh and knee come forward, my right thigh and knee go backward, come back to cent center, put your fingers on your ASISs, your left A A ASIS come forward with your thigh and knee, your right ASIS come backward, you are turned to the right and you, your rotation shows up. You can see it and feel it, especially if you put your fingers on your ASIS. That's one way of looking at the pelvic twist. Okay. You wanna make sure that again, your SI joints stay comfortable because these different movements um, go right through the sacroiliac joints and um, they're actually good for the sacroiliac joints if they feel good, but if it's causing pain, you have to back away. All right, let me just check my notes. Um, now we can add constraints. We can say, okay, I'm gonna leave my rib cage. Uh, actually, let's do, let's do it with the head and neck, it's easier. We'll get to constraints when we get to the ribcage. Let's see, you can't see enough. Okay, so now I can uh, let my, uh, I can let my pelvis rotate. I'm gonna let my trunk rotate if it wants to, I'm gonna let it rotate with it, but I'm gonna really now focus on coordinating the rotation in my pelvis with the rotation in my head and neck. And I'm going to rotate to the right in my pelvis. I'm going to let everything come along. My head and neck are rotating to the right. I'm going to rotate to the left. Come along with me. Your head and neck are rotating to the left. Come back to center. Now I'm going to vary it up. I'm going to let my pelvis go in one direction and my head and neck in another direction. So as my pelvis rotates right, I can bring my head and neck left and back to center. Let's repeat that. Rotate your pelvis to the right, your left thigh and knee are coming forward. Rotate your head and neck to the left. Come back to center one more time. Pelvis rotates right, head and neck left. Come back to center. Okay, good. Now let's go the other way. Let's have our pelvis go to our left and our head and neck to the right. So pelvis rotates left, doesn't matter what else comes along because you're focusing on feeling the pelvis rotate, head and neck to the right. Come back to center, focus on your pelvis. Pelvis rotates left, head and neck to the right. Back to center one more time. Pelvis to the left, 
head and neck to the right. When I rotate, uh, to the, when I rotate my pelvis to the left, my right knee comes more forward. My left thigh and knee back. My uh, he left hemi pelvis is back, and come back to center. Good. Okay, that were that was working with the six fundamental movements in the pelvis. We let's review. When you inhale and arch, focus on the pelvis, even though other things are coming along. That's extension in the pelvis. Come back to center, inhale to exhale, curl. That's flexion in the pelvis, that's curl or flexion. Two of the six movements, side to side in the pelvis, no matter what else comes along. If you bring your weight you bring your weight into one sits bone, it lightens the other sits bone. Now you're laterally flexing. I am laterally flexing to my left. I'm letting my whole spine make that C curve. My pelvis is high on my left side. I can laterally flex or side bend to the right. I shift my weight to my left sits bone. I elevate or lift my right or, or at least lighten it. And now my spine, I do a consistent side bending. My ear and pelvis are coming closer together. This is my short side. This is my long side. This is um, uh, side bending or lateral flexion to my right. Let's just do one more as a little bit, uh, let's do a couple as a flow. And you don't have to think, you just think about putting your weight into one side and laterally flexing to the other. Feel internally, short side, long side, and feel what's happening in your pelvis. Back to neutral. And then side bend to the other side, short side, long side. Feel what's happening in your pelvis and come back to center. Okay, so side bending right and left, two more of the six fundamental movements. And now we have rotation. I better not dally, I'm looking at the time. And rotation, everything else might rotate too, but you're feeling it in the pelvis. What has to happen at the sits bones? What has to happen at the pelvic rim? What has to happen at the ASIS? So for you to rotate your pelvis left, feel the change in the sits bone. Uh, it, 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 one is more, my right sits bone is more forward. My left sits bone is more backward. My right thigh and knee are more forward. My left thigh and knee are more backward. Going the other way, I am rotating now to my right. It's changing how I'm on my sits bone. Now my left sits bone is more forward as is my left thigh and knee. My right sits bone is more backward as is my right thigh and knee. And my as is is in the front, my left, when I rotate right, is more forward, my left is more back. And come back to center and relax. Okay, we're gonna go to the somatic center and we're gonna do the six fundamental movements in the somatic center. And, whoops, my rug is coming along. And I'm going to go back to some screen share. And I am going to go, whoops, to uh, the somatic center. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide. So the somatic center, remember, is the center of the body in the back, the famous low back area, area of so many problems and pain. The somatic center on the side, filled with the oblique muscles, the bottom of the rib cage, top of the pelvic crest. Somatic center in the front, much bigger space. All of this is somatic center in the front all the way to the pubic bone. <clears throat> here's the, here's the, um, the rim, the lower rim of the rib cage. 
Here's the rim coming around the, of the pelvic rim. Well, the pelvic crest is here and then it comes down across the pubic bone. All of this abdominal area, all of that, including your contains your center of gravity. It contains your solar plexus. All of that is within your somatic center. Let me just see uh, if I want to point out um, anything. Okay, where did I put? Here's my notes. Okay. Um, all right, I think we can do everything in movement. I'm going to come out of screen share and I'm going to move back again. Okay, so somatic center right in here, six fundamental movements. We're gonna start with extension and flexion, which is our arch and curl. And you can put your hands at, at your pubic bone and at the bottom of your sternum, the xiphoid process. And as you in and first align in sitting, uh, weight centered on your sits bone, Lay, uh, feet on the floor, weight even on the feet and legs, weight even on the sits bone. You're uh, orienting through your central axis. Your spine is right, comes through your central axis, the top of your crown, the bottom of your uh, pelvic floor. So you want to orient yourself in sitting first. This is a good thing to do periodically when you're at your desk, just that orientation to sitting. Okay, so now if you put your hand at the pubic bone and the bottom of the uh, uh, breastbone sternum at the xiphoid process, that bottom, and you inhale and arch coming forward on your sits bone and exhale and flatten, you can feel, hopefully, you can feel that on the arch, your lower back is contracting your somatic center in front is lengthening. And when you and come to neutral, inhale to exhale, exhale, curl. You're shortening in the front. Your abdominal muscles are contracting. Your back muscles are lengthening. You might be able to feel that. And then maybe you can just let your hands rest. Go, keep your awareness into your somatic center. Feel how on the arch, how long your uh, somatic center gets and how short and contracted your lower back gets. As you curl, the opposite happens. As you inhale and arch, the tailbone goes back in the pelvis, the head goes back if you're doing a consistent extension and the bottom of the rib cage and the top of the pelvis in the back, the borders of the lower back, they're closer together. And then as you curl, the lower back gets long, the bottom margin of the ribs in the front, the pelvic crest in the front, the top of the pelvic crest, they come closer together. And you can just comfortably go back and forth. We can add our arms because it feels good. Most people will externally rotate on the arch and rotate, internally rotate and round their shoulders on the curl. It just adds a little bit of dimension to it. And curl and coming back to neutral. Okay. And, and it's the forward and backward rocking. The forward and back rocking of the pelvis and the forward and backing backward rocking of the somatic center. When you're on midline movement, when you're doing midline movement, the somatic center and the pelvis, they work together. Okay, the second of the two movements um, uh, of the, uh, um, the, the, the next two movements are side bending movements in the somatic center. So again, we're gonna work with the, um, go ahead with your hands and palpate your obliques. Sometimes you can already feel, gee, one is so much tenser than the other, or maybe you don't feel that. But the, uh, 
the side bending, our focus is the lateral side of the body more. So we're going more to the lateral side of the somatic center. Although deep in our somatic center, we have the quadratus and it does a, a version of side bending. It's a little quieter because our focus is to bring this up, to bring this up rather than to have it more laterally, which is tends to be a, a larger movement. They're both important movements. Okay, so now, if you keep your hands uh, and palpating the uh, obliques at your somatic center, as you shift your weight on your sits bones and side bend to one side, you should be able to feel the difference in the tightness in your obliques on this side and the lengthening of your obliques on your other side. Come back to sitting. Likewise, you should be able to feel the difference or hopefully you can feel the difference. When you side bend to this side, your weight is shifting into this sits bone. This sits bone is lightening. It doesn't have to lift as much as mine is. It can just be a little bit if you can. And you can feel these muscles. Now these obliques are tense and tight. Hopefully these are lengthening. So the side to side movement in your somatic center and everything has to cooperate. The lower back also has to cooperate. So if I'm side bending this way, which is to my left, the inside of my curve is to the left, the longer curve. If I think of my spine, what you can see it on the outside, shorter curve, longer curve, my, my uh, lower back curve, and see if you can feel it in the low back without hurting yourself. The lower back is spine is curved also. So the inside of the lower back, lumbar one through five is curved to the left. The outside on the right side is the longer curve. So bring your awareness right into your low back, right into your spine, lumbar one through five without hurting yourself. Start to see if you go inside you're in your lumbar spine, in your low back. As this hip rises up, I'm to my right. See if you can feel the right side of your spine, those spinal muscles right on the right side. See if you can feel them contract to the inside of that right curve. And now the left side of your lower back, the left lumbar area muscles, they're lengthening and come back to center. It's such an important area. We're gonna talk about it a little bit more when we put everything together, but your somatic center has to negotiate all oppositional movement of the six fundamental movements. So it, the somatic center has to negotiate upper body to lower body has to negotiate right side to left side. And your somatic center has to negotiate the front of your body with the back of your body. All movement needs to be negotiated through the somatic center. That's why it's so important to keep these muscles as flexible and as comfortable as possible so they can extend and flex and side bend. And now we're gonna go to rotation. Okay, let me just check my notes. Okay. And let's go to rotation of the somatic center. All right, so we're still in the somatic center. And put your finger on your belly button. And if you can easily reach, I'm gonna kind of go back with a soft fist your lower back, right? I'm gonna put my, my knuckles kind of right on my spine, right on, right on those spinous processes where the spine sticks out. Now, I'm gonna rotate my somatic center. It doesn't matter what else comes along, my pelvis, my ribs, my head and neck, but I wanna feel the rotation in my somatic center. So if I rotate to my left, my belly button goes to the left, my low back goes to the right and back to center. Let's go the other way. If I rotate to the right, my belly button comes to the right, 
my, my spine, my low back lumbar spine goes to the left. See if you can feel it. Do that a few times. Rotate so your belly button goes left. Where does your low back spine go? It goes to the right. Back to center. If you bring your, rotate your belly button, rotation is turning or twisting, rotate to the right. Your low back spine, your lumbar spine goes to the left. There's a shift, there's a rotation at your somatic center. Now the somatic center in rotation is really interesting because there's lots of combinations of rotation that we have in the whole body and your somatic center needs to negotiate all those different rotations. So we have, for example, um, if, we, if we bring our, um, if we bring, well, we're gonna do that with ribcage. So I think I'll wait on that. Uh, but the important thing to know about your somatic center is that it, ha again, all six movements, it has to extend and flex, it has to side bend, and it has to rotate. It has to rotate. And that's the, the crux of movement in the body is that somatic center has to negotiate those movements. Okay. Let's go to the rib cage, our third section. We did the pelvis, we did the somatic center. Now we're gonna to go to the rib cage. So with the rib cage, I'm gonna go back into screen share. Okay, so with the rib cage, let's just look at a few landmarks again to keep it in our mind, our anatomical landmarks. Okay. The clavicle or collarbone, the first rib goes right under it. The clavicle is usually considered the top of the rectangle of the trunk. Okay. The uh, ribs get from the top, as they go down, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. This, the top rib is uh, actually the top two ribs, but especially the top rib, rib, it's like wearing a choker. It's quite small. And then you have the breastbone or sternum. It's got different parts. But if you look here where the ribs connect into the sternum, you see this other, this is cartilage, this sort of bluish grayish is cartilage. And where the cart, I'll just go to this one, where the cartilage meets the sternum, that's a joint. And where the cartilage becomes bone, that's a joint. There's a certain amount of movement. It's not voluntary movement. If I said voluntarily move this, move, this joint, um, well, maybe some people can, I don't think I can, but, but it's not considered a voluntary joint. But of, as you move, the, there's space for these joints to be able to move. So you've got all these joints, all these joints, all these joints, you've got all these joints. And in the back, you, I don't have a small picture of it, but where each rib comes in on each side, there are three joints per rib into each, into the spine. So three, 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 three for all 12 ribs on both sides. There are over 100 joints in the rib cage. We often think of our rib cage as a cage, even think of the word, and that makes us kind of hold our ribs stiff often. But the ribs, the, the rib case needs to be flexible and not hard. And we start to do that by focusing on the movement with it. So very, very, very important um, that we understand a little bit more about the joints and that the sternum and the thoracic spine are connect front to back all the ribs. Okay, let's come out of screen share. I'm gonna move my chair back again. Okay, six, we have uh, six fundamental movements in the rib cage. We have, we're gonna start with 
extension and flexion. That's the arch and curl, extension and flexion in the rib cage. Other things may come along, focus on what your rib cage is doing. A lot of times we have a hard time keeping our focus on the rib cage because there's so much sensory motor amnesia or so much contraction in our rib cage. And a lot of the problems we have in the lower body, a lot of the problems we have all over with movement is because our rib cage is so caged, is so stiff. Okay, so as we begin our art, so orient to sitting, sorry, feet on the floor, ankles under knees, feel the sits bones, distribute your weight evenly on your sits bones, crown of the head to center of the uh, pelvic floor, vertical axis, all right, rib cage. So we're going to start and as we, as we inhale and arch and exhale and curl, let's start by focusing on when we arch, which ribs open, which ribs close. When we curl, which ribs close, which ribs open. So inhale, do a very gentle arch so you can hold it a little bit so that you can really feel how the ribs in the front open up or want to open up. And the ribs in the back are squeezing closer together. Now come to your neutral. And now let's go into a curl. So inhale to exhale, go into a gentle curl so you can hold it a little bit. So you can really get your awareness in your rib cage and feel how the ribs in the front get closer together and take a few seconds to feel how the ribs in the back are opening up or want to open up and come back to center. Now, perhaps you can feel this. There's a lot more space for the lungs in the back. Your, the back of your lungs has more space than the lungs in the front. If you bring your hands under the costal margin, the margin of the rib cage, sort of close to the center. From here to the top to just under to actually your lungs come a little above your clavicle, but your your rib cage is just right approximately the first rib is just comes right under that clavicle. From from here to here in the center, it's not that big of a space. But in the back, if you touch the base of your neck, top of your thoracic spine, and then you kind of intuit where the bottom of your rib cage is, it's kind of buried. You can kind of follow your ribs around and then they get buried in muscle. The rib cage in the back along the midline is very long, much shorter here, much longer here. And then as you're uh, as this margin becomes lower and lower, the proportions change a little bit, but more rib space in the back than in the front. Now, let's think about the sides. We're gonna do side movement in a moment, but when you are arching and when you are curling and some ribs are opening and some ribs are coming closer together, the sides have to negotiate that change. I've tried to feel it at different times. It's not that easy because I can feel the side going towards the back, that's already closing. The side's coming more towards the front, that's already opening. So the sides of our rib cage have to negotiate the transition from uh, closed to open and vice versa. Okay, let's put our, let's go to our sternum. Sternum is really interesting and a lot of people don't even think about their sternum. But the sternum is really important. And um, I'm going to stay fairly high, although I might come a little bit into my breast material. Little, uh, but because what one of the things that's a really nice thing to do, I think you can see that I'm, I'm kind of feeling for the edge of my sternum where the sternum, where the sternum meets the ribs. And I'm kind of putting kind of poking, but not hurting myself, poking my fingers right at the edge, the lateral edges of the sternum, feeling the ribs. Now, a really nice thing to do, I think it feels really good, as you inhale and arch and the front ribs open, you can spread your sternum and those joints a little bit, and it feels really good. 
and then come to your neutral. Now, as you curl, inhale to exhale, curl, and the front ribs close, you can gently help to hollow your breastbone backward towards your spine, and you can kind of squeeze a little bit into your breastbone, the, the, the ribs right next to your breastbone. Inhale, arch and open. Inhale, arch and open. Inhale, arch and open. And then just come to neutral and give yourself a few seconds to see how that feels. It often adds this whole dimension to the sensations as well as really physically helping to get those joints to be more flexible. The joints from the ribs coming into each other, costal, the cartilage to the bone, and then the cartilage into the sternum. Okay, let's go to side to side movement. <clears throat> In the rib cage, focusing on the rib cage, a lot of other things are happening. We've got to shift our weight into um, one of our sits bones so the other can rise up. We have to contract our obliques and our armpit comes down a little bit and feel the ribs on the inside of the curve, the inside of the curve, feel those ribs close down. These ribs on this side, they're opening up and you can raise your arm to even open them up more. Okay, let's go to the other side. To side, we have to side bend. We shift our weight into, uh, one sits bone is holding the weight, the other can lighten up, the obliques contract, the ear, the head, side bends, and we bring our armpit down. Give yourself a few seconds, as long as you're comfortable to feel, to feel the squeezing of the ribs on the side, the opening of the ribs on the other side. Very gently, one of the things I like to do, because I need to get onto rotation before the class ends. Oh, actually, I want to point out a couple of things. This is important. When you inhale and arch and you open your ribs, the front of your chest is broadening. When you exhale and curl, the front of your chest is narrowing. Your, your shoulders help that, but this is narrowing. How many of us walk around very narrowed or in sitting, we go narrow. So feel that now you're more narrow in the back between the shoulder blades and you're more open in the front. Now you're more narrow in the front, your ribs coming into the sternum, your shoulder blades are coming away from your spine and you're broader in the back. So broadening and narrowing are very important aspects of, of flexibility in the rib cage. And one more thing I wanna do is do this gently. Take your thumb or finger if you can reach and just gently find between two ribs. There'll be a rib, a bone hump, and then a space and then a rib bone hump. And you'd be surprised, isn't it? There's a lot of tenderness if you poke too much. But as, as you go side to side, you can actually sort of massage the sides of the intercostals. And as you squeeze on one side, it increases the pressure on that trigger point. The other opens up a little bit and it can coax on the long side, it can coax those ribs open a little bit more. And then you change sides, you feel the ribs squeeze together. And then the, your finger between the two ribs may be able to coax those ribs open a little bit. And it's very nice to take the time, which we're not gonna do today. And sometimes I'll take 15, 20 minutes in bed. Sometimes they take that long with one side. Um, and I work the trigger points as I side bend in my rib cage. Okay, let's go to the last two movements of the rib cage, rotation to the right, rotation to the left. So, uh, I'm going to take the arms out of it by doing cross hands, not tight, just loose cross hands. If that's not comfortable, you can do it lower because I think it, it's easier to focus on the rib cage rotating. So you're going to focus on your sternum as your guide and you're going to let yourself rotate to one direction. This is my left. So my sternum is going left. My thoracic spine is going right and back to center. Now I'm going to 
focus on my sternum going to my right. My sternum is right. My thoracic spine goes left, back to center. And just see if you can find your sternum, find your breastbone and just very slowly turn in one, turn, rotate to either the right or the left. See if you can feel your rib cage rotating, feel the change in the sternum and thoracic spine and come back to center. It's a little easier for me to feel where my sternum or my breastbone is. And I have to really kind of focus on oh, there's at least some of my thoracic spine. It's behind me. I don't, I don't think about it that much, but you've got this nice rotational movement uh, right and left. So rotation right, rotation left, two more fundamental movements. Okay. Now we can add the arms just for something to add. As we rotate to the right, as we rotate our rib cage to the right, my right arm wants to externally rotate, my left arm wants to internally rotate. I come back to neutral. There's a lot of patterns that are fine, that are okay. Yours may wanna do something else. Just notice what your arms wanna do. As I rotate my rib cage, my left arm wants to externally rotate, my right arm wants to internally rotate. It's just, it's just uh, very interesting. Some people may actually have a reverse pattern. It's okay. It's just what your body has. It's how your muscles are uh, contracted already that tells you how your different joints are going to move. We can even add the legs a little bit since we're coming towards the end. I'm going to rotate to my right and I'm going to let everything Rotate to the right. Ah, let me go down a little bit more. See if you can see this. Okay, so I'm going to rotate. I'm going to start in my breastbone. I'm going to let my, my, my pelvis go to the right, my somatic center, even my legs and even my arms are rotating and my head and neck back to center. I can rotate everything in the other direction and back to center. Now I can rotate my lower body contralateral rotation in one direction, my upper body in the opposite direction. Notice your somatic center has to negotiate the change. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. It's gonna be a little easier for, for you to see and, and this is actually a nice position. I'm going to let my pelvis go right, my lower body right, my upper body left. I'm going to come back to center. Let's repeat. Lower pelvis, legs go with pelvis to the right or to one side, upper body to the opposite. Now, bring your awareness to your pelvis. Feel your, where your pelvis is rotated. Go to your rib cage. Feel your rib cage is rotated opposite your pelvis. Now go to your somatic center. That has to negotiate the change between the upper and lower body. Not that easy to suss out. Okay, now I'm gonna let my lower body, my pelvis is gonna to rotate to my left, my rib cage and upper body, head and neck to the right. I'm gonna come back to center. I'm gonna repeat that. And take a moment, don't go too far so you can hold a little bit. Can you feel? Your pelvis is rotated in one direction, your rib cage is rotated in the opposite direction, and your somatic center, bring your awareness, has to negotiate that change, that oppositional rotation between the pelvis and the rib cage, and come back to center. Well, there's always a lot more we can do, but that's what we're going to. I'm going to bring the class, whoops, to a close. And I just want to say uh, in, in closing that uh, ah, we're going to go over a minute. Where's my last notes? Okay. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to actually put on a screen share. I don't want this to shock every anybody, but uh, it, it illustrates a point I want to I want to make in closing. So let me go to screen share, and put this. Say hello, hello, hello. Okay. Did it was it for very long? Okay. So we're at this dissection. Here's the brain. Here's the skull. Uh, I believe it's the retina is considered brain tissue. So your eyes really contain some brain tissue. Um, and then here's your spinal cord. Your spinal cord is inside your ver vertebral bodies. Is inside your spine. The bony spine protects the spinal cord. And then all of these things, <laughs> these are nerves. These are nerves coming out between the vertebrae. These are nerves. We want to keep our central axis nice and lengthened and spacious. If we are overextended, we're squishing our nerves in the back. If we are too curled forward, we're squishing our nerves coming to the front. If we are chronically contracted so that our right side is, we're side bent to our right side, then we're squishing our nerves on the right side. If we're side chronically side bent to the left, we're squishing the nerves on the left. If we're rotated, there's different rotations. The rotations are either going to squish one side or the other side, and sometimes the upper quadrant on one side, the lower quadrant on the other side. It's very important to keep ourself and our trunk, our rib cage, our somatic center and our pelvis very, very open and flexible so that we can align ourselves in sitting or standing or any position we're in. We can take the, 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 the best postural position we can have to do the activities that we're having so that the motor nerves coming from the brain out to our muscles can function well and we can we have good uh, control good motor control and the sensory nerves from the periphery that come into the spinal cord and go up that we can sense and give good feedback to our motor system so Fundamental six reference ranges of motion are always important to do and to review. Let's just review the six fundamental uh, movements in our three-dimensional world are extension, flexion, side bending to one side, side bending to the other side, rotating to one side, rotating to the other side. So I hope today's lesson provided you with more information and understanding anatomically, and that helped you to focus in on the, on the movements that you were doing. As this series progresses throughout the year, I'm going to add more information, more parts of the body, and I may not have as much anatomy as I did today, but for those of you that are with me today and continue in the future, you'll have a really good foundation. So um, just remember, natural easy alignment of our body is what makes our body work and it keeps us moving, flexible and strong. Thank you everyone. I hope to see a lot of you or all of you in February. I think it's February 6th, but I'll send the notice. Thank you.